Brilliant. Thank you so much to all of our um, panellists and presenters. I thought those were absolutely fascinating and you did a brilliant job of making it understandable even for kind of non-academics like me. So thank you for that. I'd love to invite all of the um, presenters to um, pop their videos on and to unmute themselves. We've got loads of amazing questions. Um, and for me, I think the really fascinating thing and, and probably one of the, well, not probably, one of the brilliant things about the fact that, you know, this this whole panel and the whole of the York Talks are interdisciplinary is showing that these, these topics that are covered are so complex and do cross so many different subject areas and, um, you know, geog geographical boundaries and all that sort of thing. So um, I'm left feeling a bit um, overwhelmed, I guess, in terms of the complexity of some of these issues. So I guess the first question, selfishly, that I want to kick off with is how optimistic do each of you feel about the fact that we can overcome these issues and we can develop that resilience and these big climate issues? Like how, how optimistic or otherwise are you feeling about the future? Um, so I'm just going to, let me see if I can, um, I'm just going to go to, to you as I can see you on my screen. So Henrika, you're first. Do you mind just giving us a really brief how you're yeah. feeling? So if I speak specifically about the area that I'm concerned with and, and specifically the inner city communities in, in a global south city um, of Kingston, then I am somewhat optimistic, more optimistic than probably if you'd asked me a year ago, because I do think that the, the pandemic has led to some changes in bigger discussions that are really important about climate change. And I think Matt's talk really highlighted that as well. Um, so for Kingston, for example, um, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, um, there's now this discussion about, you know, this massive debt that a country like Jamaica, a small island state has to swap the debt for climate change adaptation. And I think mm. that momentum is really growing and it was already there. It's been there, you know, for a couple of years, but really as a result of the pandemic, it's been increasing. Um, but there are still some concerns, um, um, you know, generally when you think about environmentalism, focuses often on green environmentalism like protection, conservation, coral reefs, etc., and less on this brown environmentalism. And, and, you know, there are like UN Habitat who's been paying more attention to the need to focus on things like water waste and sanitation services, but I think that emphasis needs to be more important if during climate change, as a result of climate change, there's going to be more droughts and water supply is becoming really problematic, then fixing leaking water pipes is, is an important step to take. Uh, and also guaranteeing that people have access to, um, you know, health, you know, um, um, good quality water as well. But in a place like Jamaica, where there's a strong tradition of political partisanship, a lot of these, you know, measures that require buy-in from both parties may be quite difficult to get. Um, and, and I think, you know, people are generally familiar with partisanship in a place like the US, where, you know, legislation uh, cannot be passed because people vote on the basis of party uh, affiliation and, and strong party affiliation, but it's often being ignored when it comes to like places in the global south. So I think that is a, is a major barrier in, in, in some of these small island developing states in the Caribbean. And, and you know, most of the Anglophone Caribbean uh, states uh, have this strong tradition of partisanship. But I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic then, and, and you know, that things are moving in, in, in the right direction, but I would like to see more emphasis on brown environmentalism. Yeah, definitely. And it's something that hadn't sort of, you know, shamefully hadn't even occurred to me at all. So thank you for opening my eyes to that. Um, Matt, how optimistic or otherwise, very briefly, are you feeling? So I, I go from being optimistic to being not optimistic, which I think is a pretty common kind of feature. <laughs> I'm optimistic about things like how we've removed coal from our electricity generation. And I think I'm optimistic if we think about the climate problem as being an engineering problem and not a, you know, moving beyond it being a, is climate change happening, to being questions about how are we going to make those changes? How are we going to bring society along with us as we make those changes? Um, how will life look as we move towards making those changes? And I think if you look at some of the things like the Climate Commission and the work that they're doing in looking at what 2050 might look like and get us to carbon neutral. Um, it's a world people can buy into. And I think if we can get people buying into that world, I, I think we'll make changes. I think there's a concern about 
how the rest of the world does this and making sure that the rest of the world um, deals with its problems as well as it being for the UK. But uh, yeah, I oscillate between despair and optimism. I think that's quite common for those of us in the, in the climate space, isn't it? Um, Lindsay, how about you? How are you feeling? I'm, I'm oscillating as well, I have to say. And in the in the context, uh, context of um, Eswatini, I think, well, it's, it's in the developing world in general, there are a lot of opportunities to, to bring together um, climate change mitigation with more sustainable land management and also climate change adaptation as well. We hear a lot in the UK about um, planting trees and how that's really good in terms of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but we just need to make sure, I, I'm a bit cautious because we just need to make sure that we're planting the right things in the right places and that we're not, uh, in addressing climate change, we're not causing other issues to get worse. So I think it's keeping that joined up view is gonna be really important both in the developing world and in, in developed countries if we are gonna be able to harness the opportunities that are available. Yeah, and um, Bob, your talk I thought highlighted, you know, just how complex even, I say just the food system, but do, do you know like, that that is, how, how do you feel about how it's going to adapt and how we're going to adapt moving forwards? Yeah, I mean, I, I move also between optimism and, and despair, uh, particularly optimism. I think uh, there's an increasing consensus, consensus in the United Kingdom, I think, to really tackle, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in agriculture. Uh, National Farmers Union, you know, making a pledge, uh, the President Minute Batters to reduce uh, carbon to net zero, but it's very much about harm reduction, uh, rather than actually thinking about more regenerative approaches to agriculture, uh, you know, like promoting carbon sequestration, mm. you know, seeing it as a positive, uh, as a positive good, improving soil health, but I actually think there's pockets of innovation, there's pockets of farmers uh, all across the country that actually get it, and this case of scaling up those practices um, in terms of no tillage and uh, other, other approaches that, that all farmers could benefit, benefit from really. In terms of international development, I agree with Lindsay. I'm really concerned about smallholder farmers who are really at the forefront of climate change. Uh, and, and again, there is there's a need for more research. There are some really good uh, uh, examples of adaptation and mitigation in, in terms of working with smallholders, but there's a really interesting paper recently in Nature is that, that smallholders are often forgotten in research. So I think we really need to plug, uh, plug that gap. There's some great um, innovate technolo technological innovation um, on, the, on, on, the, on the horizon, which might help. And obviously the UK with COP26 coming up in the autumn is really has to be right at the forefront. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Now, we've got um, over 20 questions, which is amazing, um, but we've got 25 minutes. So I know that you guys could all talk. Um, you know, this, these are your, your passions as well, um, but we're really going to have to go for brevity. But um, uh, if it's OK, I mean, let us know if it's not. But are you happy for people to email you for sort of more in-depth uh, discussions and um, answers and that kind of thing if we're not able to answer them um, fully in this time? And I'm just going to go through the questions. Um, as I can see them, because there's so many to, to go through. Um, let's have a look. Um, so question for Matt. Um, should we be treating the climate crisis in the same manner as we're treating the COVID crisis, i.e. defined periods of lockdown to reduce environmental atmospheric pollutant concentrations? What a great um, idea. I wonder if people would sort of put up with that. What do you think, Matt? So I think if we did do that, we would reduce the emissions. But I don't think that's a tractable solution to the problem, because even if we reduce things by uh, we, you know, going to lockdown for six months of the year, um, that's not going to reduce the emissions by as much as we need to reduce them by. So I don't think that kind of um, so what we need to do is just large amounts of societal change about how we generate energy, how we transport long term long thinking i think is what we need we uh, a short term fix like that um is going to alienate people even more i think getting people on side with that is going to be impossible and actually unless we make changes to how we generate electricity how we travel how we how we make food how we do all of these things um it's not going to have the impact that we want so i think slow and steady is much better than um you know some sort of quick fix where we all hibernate for six months of the year and then go back to where we were before. Yeah, and I think it was quite telling, wasn't it, that like literally in that first phase of the pandemic where the world, it felt like the world literally stopped, 
as you say, we didn't see that massive a reduction, certainly in CO2, which was kind of like, oh, gosh, we're really going to have to pull our finger out with this one, aren't we? Like if we want to. Um... It's a long lived gas and we yeah. need a long lived solution to it. Definitely. Um, a question from Simon about soy. Soy is also grown in Europe. So how far can that be sustainably scaled up? Um, and as well, plant sources of protein such as, I'm um, going to make sure I say this right, quinoa, uh, lentils and a wide range of beans and peas are grown in England. So again, how can these be scaled up and would it help with land use and sustainability and I guess issues around biodiversity and things like that? Um, I guess that's for you, Bob. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there are alternatives to, to soy. Uh, um, it's too early to tell whether they can be scaled up, but I'm sure some of them can. There's, there's some good work going on in things like lupins and and other 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 um, alternative sources, uh, and there are also new technologies on the forefront as well, such as using insect larva uh, for animal protein and also algae. Um, so lots of lots of uh, mm. emerging technologies, uh, in, you know, on at the forefront. But we do do need to be looking at alternatives for sure. We need to be increasing crop rotations in the United Kingdom. There's some really interesting. Farmers in Yorkshire that grow uh, fava beans and lent and other. Is that other, hodmer dogs, uh, is it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and so, yeah, but it's whether they can be scaled up. But there are other. I think it's a multi-criteria. Needs a mul multiple number of uh, different measures. But we can't going forward for sure uh, see the see the negative impacts that we create by uh, by our animal feed and soy. It just can't continue. Yeah, and um, you mentioned insect protein there. Our dog is actually we've we've got found a food that is insect protein based, um, which she seems to enjoy, and um, you know just looks like regular dog food. So it's quite interesting to see how that um, technology can um, sort of be uh, rolled out. I guess. Um, question for you, Lindsay: Have you had much success in disseminating your findings to other neighbouring communities? And there was a similar question, I think, which said about. Um, uh, to ask if you work with universities in in the area um, or other local institutions so that they can continue sort of implementing changes after you've um, sort of gone and had your celebration. Yeah, so we did the celebration just as a, a kind of experiment to see how things would work in terms of what local people wanted for, for disseminating the research and learning about the findings. So we just worked in that one village. Um, but during the original research, I worked across three different villages. So we did actually go back to all three villages and share the findings with them, not through the, the, the celebration, but just by, by chatting with the chief. Um, it's also really, really important to, to work with the local institutions as, as the question uh, noted. Um, and all the work was done throughout with working with master's students and staff at the University of, of Eswatini, because they, they know the context way better than, than I do. Um, and that they know what's appropriate, they, they know how to approach things a lot better. And yes, I can learn while I'm there, but it helps, you know, you can hit the ground running when you've, when you've got that support. Um, just to add, we, we also disseminated the results with, with people from government as well. And the research findings did make it into the review of the National Action Programme on, on land degradation um, as well. And I've done a lot of work through the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services at the, the global scale. So I have fed that work in upwards as well. So, yeah, I'm trying to reach out in all different directions. It looks a bit like Bob's network map as to how the, the direction of the dissemination is going. But uh, it's, it's always a, a question of cash and resources to be able to reach the people that you want to reach in the ways that you need to, to reach them. So, it's yeah, definitely. Yeah, and Victoria's got a question that I guess ultimately is is. Um, I mean, she asked, is it the most important question to ask? And it feels to me like a really important question. Do you think the village residents have improved their land management as a result of the, the sort of research you did and the celebration to share that information? And that's that's what I would need to go back to be able okay. to, to properly assess. But you know, people did say that they learned things while they were there. A lot of the land management practices that people were coming up with through the research that we identified were things that you might think are, are quite basic because they're in global databases as to sustainable land management practices. So things like not plowing up and down the slope and plowing across the slope, for example. Um, oh, yeah. Just basic things like that, maintaining cover crops, um, intercropping with, with pulses and crops like that that can add nitrogen to the soil in, in between the maize crop. Um, all, all those land management practices, which we've known about for a long time, but people in the village, they don't necessarily know why they're doing them. They, mm -hmm. they will do them without realizing the benefits in some cases, or they'll do them because previous generations use them. Um, and then as, as people move out of agriculture, those practices get lost. So it's important 
it was great at the uh, celebration that the, the kids were involved because then they got to learn about them a little bit as well so uh, yeah lovely yeah I have to go back for a proper assessment though like I said Yes, and that plea for um, for anyone who who would like to fund you to do that would be fabulous. Would be, would be um, amazing. <laughs> and um, Lindsay, you've you've all sort of um, alluded to this a little bit, so maybe I'll um, because this is a question for both you and Henrique, so we'll get Henrique's perspective on this. But um, Stephanie says these are really lovely projects working at the sharp end of climate change and environmental degradation. Um, have the results also been fed up with, and I think you um, spoke to this, Lindsay, um, to policymakers at a global scale? And do you have a sense of how these types of local insights can be brought to more global attention? So, Henrico, I don't know if you just want to um, come in on that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I, I think I come at it from a, a rather different perspective than, let's say, Lindsay, who's based in, in an environmental sciences department, because I'm a social historian and, and my initial you know coming at a project like this is not to say right this is what policymakers need to do my interest is much more to unpack you know the ways in which these social and power relations have affected the impact which then you know ideally if policymakers are more aware of it can help them when they start to think about things like climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies so that they know that these can too affect different populations in different ways. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, um, Bob earlier on made a plug for COP, which is happening, um, you know, later this year, and, and he wants to have more attention on, on the small farmers. And I would at the same time say, well, also, let's think about inner city areas. Let's think about these, you know, major cities in the global south, where many parts of the population don't have access to waterways and sanitation services. And what can we do around that? Because you know, they are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis major environmental risks as a result. Yes, there are you know, natural disasters that are also uh, posing a major hazard, but on a day-to-day -day basis, people encounter lots of problems with not having access to these basic services. Mm -hmm. So if I was uh, attending COP, that would be my message. Um, but as a social historian, it's less, we're less there to say, well, this is what policymakers mm -hmm. need to do. Yeah. Um, and a bit of a follow up question, I guess, almost to that from Robert saying, um, could you expand on the role, if any, that green infrastructure plays in dealing with some of the challenges you mentioned around water resources in Kingston? Um, is green infrastructure valued or managed by municipal authorities or the inhabitants? Yeah, so, um, you know, like, many parts of the global south water security is becoming a major problem in jamaica and it particularly affects the small farmers <laughs> but also increasingly when you look at you know the major the major cities in in, in these small island developing states of the caribbean um you know water supply is is problematic uh, during the the, the the season where it's normally you know the dry season but increasingly there's droughts now. So in the last couple of years, some, you know, for, for Kingston, Jamaica, some um, uh, with international donor funding, like from USAID, um, projects are going on, tree planting, for example, in the watershed area that feeds into Kingston, rainwater harvesting projects are going on. But these tend to be quite short-lived projects. So they just, you know, uh, we'll try this, we'll pilot it. And then, you know, it's usually then up to the government to decide whether it wants to fund and, and, and scale it up. Uh, but these are, these are quite recent, only in the last four or five years that some of that has been going on. And then around, you know, whether it's the municipal authorities, well, actually the Kingston and St. Andrew Corporation, the local authority has been stripped of a lot of its major responsibilities since the 1980s as part of a kind of a neoliberal um, uh, shift that's been happening. Uh, so it doesn't even have the control anymore over waste collection or uh, water provision or whatever. So these green infrastructure projects, they're very much donor driven projects, uh, very short term donor driven projects. Mm, definitely. Well, we've got lots of questions or um, around food and food waste and things. So mm -hmm. um, Peter asks, where does tackling food waste fit into developing resilience in food systems? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important uh, part of the of the uh, vulnerabilities in the food system. I could have done a talk all about food waste and it's food waste right across the food system. Mm -hmm. I think from farm all the way through to, uh, through the supply chain, all the way through to uh, consumption as well. And um, in fact, the funding that we, with the new funding that we have, uh, we've managed to be successful in securing, there was another big fund for waste and resources as well to, to tackle some of these problems. And obviously the University of York 
were right at the forefront with BioVale, uh, with BioYork, and also with the Waste Network in the York Environmental Sustainability Institute as well, looking at different ways of, of you know, reusing waste, uh, making making new food out of uh, out of waste, mm. using the surplus also for, you know, in the food banking system. There's lots of uh, ways that we we can we can tackle waste waste and resources, and obviously the pandemic is really focused down on waste in the household, everybody home cooking and and uh, and I don't know whether you put your bins out recently. They're 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 quite heavy uh, with household waste, and so um, you know it, it is a real uh, real important issue. And there's lots of really interesting work going on. And we we aim in the new program that, we, that over the next five years to collaborate with a number of these organisations, such as BioVale, collaborate with industry to take food waste out of the system. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think I know initially during the pandemic, at the very start, there was an increase in, in consumer food waste because people had stockpiled and then it sort of all went out of date. And then there was I was reading stats that, that household food waste had reduced by sort of 30 percent during that first lockdown. And I don't know if any data has come out since then, whether that's gone back up again or whether, you know, whether it does follow a cyclical thing with lockdowns and things. It would be quite interesting to mm. um, to sort of see what the patterns have been, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. And another Another question about um, food waste, Bob, uh, even without the COVID issue, how much waste at source does the just in time method create? Um, so if we get unseasonable weather or even things like, you know, the Delia effect or the Mary Berry effect or the Nigella effect, yeah. um, what sort of issues do we have there? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that I talk to farmers a lot and some farmers talk about the fact that they have a contract with a particular major multiple supermarket. They decide because of you know, whatever reasons, demand reasons, that they only want 70% of the crop. Uh, they often then plow that crop back into the land mm -hmm. because there's no other, no other alternative. But actually there's some really interesting businesses that are springing up. There's one that I really love right near York called Food Circle, where they aggregate supply from a network of farmers of food that would have otherwise gone to waste, which is potatoes, carrots, really very much work, work on the Yorkshire Wolds in the Vale of York. And they aggregate this, that supply, sell it to some high class restaurants at, at reasonable prices, but they also have these pop up shops in areas of disadvantaged uh, communities in York, where they, they provide markets on a, on a regular basis at, at low cost, do di direct deliveries to households and, and, and the people that, that organize it have been never, been, never been busier during the, oh, during the yeah. pandemic, they, their businesses are really, really struggling to cope. And so I yeah. think that's actually a really good example. The user, the user app, to aggregate the supply and, and 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 good relationships with the farmers. So I think those are all positive, positive developments. I feel that sounds like an amazing project, and it's one of those. Again, a lot of these solutions, you sort of hear them, and you're like, oh yeah, that's really common sense. Why why is that not happening everywhere? So you know, hopefully, some of these solutions can be um, can be rolled out. Um, and this was addressed as a question for you, Bob, but I, I think it's probably a question that everyone can answer. Does the government need to take more lead in creating resilience, I guess, throughout all of our all of our systems? Um, Bob, if you want to go first, but then if anyone else wants to come in on that, I think it's... Yeah, I think there's a... The, I mean, for far too long, the government's uh, let the market deal with the food system. And as we've seen, that's not necessarily... You know, it hasn't created a lot of... You know, there's been some, been some negative outcomes to that. But I think there's a growing uh, consensus in government and you've got the national food strategy that's being developed at the moment led by Henry Dimbleby. There's a growing need, I think, for government to intervene, both in positive fiscal measures, but also in legislation. When you do talk to retailers, they want a level playing field. They want the good practice to be in a legal framework and particularly the ones that are proactive about um, resilience and sustainability. So I think we'll see, I'm hoping, Certainly in my policy work, um, you know, areas for intervention are definitely the, the hot topic at the moment. Mm. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on um, sort of government involvement or otherwise in, in developing resilience? Go on, Lindsay. I don't think we can just rely on government. I think mm -hmm. there is a big momentum from the bottom up and that actually people's own behaviours and decisions you know, people are getting more aware of the different challenges that we're facing and how they come to, together to affect the individual um, and the household and the community and so on. We see some great city-based initiatives. Um, we see some great NGO initiatives. I think there's no one size fits all and it's gonna be really con contextually dependent, but everybody needs to join in at all levels really. Definitely. 
anybody else wants or should we move on to the next and we come in matt are you are you happy with that um again go on matt no i think i think it's you know we need to attack these problems both as individuals as communities as sit as countries internationally um you know all of these big wicked problems that we face don't have simple solutions mm. and they're, they're complicated solutions at all levels of society and so you know there's it's incumbent on me as an individual to try and do my best in these kind of things, but it's also incumbent on the government to to address some of these problems. Yeah, definitely. Um, Enrico, you, do, do you have anything to come in or are you happy to move on? Yeah, I think, you know, resilience is it's, it's quite a contentious uh, concept across academia, um, but also, you know, a government may want to instill resilience. It's a buzzword that's used a lot. Um, but, you know, obviously, um, in order to create community resilience, the community needs the resources to uh, enable it to build up that resilience. And, you know, a lot of that is sometimes done with, as Lindsay said, with NGO support or, or um, charity support or whatever. But, um, you know, it's, it's about whose resilience, you know, um, I think that's a crucial one. But we, we have to look at it at all levels, the local, the global, the national, the community. But it's often also thinking about what what actually does a community see as its major problems when it comes to climate change or food security or whatever and that's often not quite done um, we've been working with the international red cross for example who work with um, uh, vulnerability and capability assessments where they actually go into a community and and make them think about what are their priorities rather mm -hmm. than coming in and say well your priorities that you're yeah. get flooded but let them think about what it is and then together work up with what might be some of the solutions we could adopt to address those 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 vulnerabilities. Yeah, definitely. Um, and a question from Julia, who I think may have had to disappear, but um, she talks about um, this idea that of these super wicked problems um, and, and sort of super good solutions. Is it simply a question of um, sort of how we continue combating these very complex infrastructure by using language across the many sectors and um, so she talks about um marcus rashford and and sort of this idea of the beautiful game and how it's it's sort of um moved across from football i guess into the um uh food poverty and things like that how do people feel that language impacts the um how we tackle these problems i don't know who wants to go should i pick someone to go first matt do you want to go first on that one Oh, that's probably outside of what I think about as a poor chemist. <laughs> um, I think there is an issue with language and I think there's also an issue with optimism in that I think very often we couch these conversations in very negative terms mm. about things that will be done to people. And actually, I think couching these in the in the opportunities and, uh, you know, won't it be great that you'll be able to go out for a walk in Leeds and not be subject to NO2 concentrations that are mm. harmful for you? Um, it, uh, instead of couching it as being, won't it be awful that you'll have to charge up your electric car every 250 miles? And I think there is a role for language here in thinking about positivity and enthusiasm and not having things inflicted on people, but the, op the, the, the new opportunities that the future will, world will present. And I do get very cross about some of the negative language when we should be talking about the great opportunities for a better life that people will have through the changes that we'll need to make. I think for a poor chemist, you articulated that incredibly well, Matt, thank you. <laughs> um, Lindsay, do you have any um, any ideas about use of language? Yeah, I, I just think what, what Matt said fits nicely with my talk in that we celebrated the research findings. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of science that we can celebrate recently with the vaccine for the COVID and so on. And, you know, as we look towards a, a more sustainable future, I think it's important that we do celebrate our successes as well as, you know, learning lessons from other places, learning lessons across sectors and making sure that the language that we are using, it isn't kind of, I don't know, inflammatory, overdramatic and, you know, really going to push people into thinking one thing or another. I, mean, I think we need to create the context with the language that's used in talking about this is these issues um, that really allows people to make their own opinions um and to to be able to as i say celebrate the successes but also know where more work is is needed thank you um henrika did you have anything to come in on that yeah i think it's it's a need for a more also a more nuanced language as well mm. um 
At the moment, I'm following a, a big debate happening in Jamaica around this cockpit country because the government allowed bauxite mining to take place in this bio, you know, incredibly biodiverse area. And if you look at the discussions there, it's around, right, if we don't allow it, um, then you know, the country doesn't get the resource it needs, its GDP will decline even further, we can't develop. And then it's pitched against these environmentalists who deprive us of this, this important resource. So it's, it's very much, you know, us versus them mm. discussion rather than thinking about it in a more nuanced way. And I think that is, is quite important as well, that we don't just, you know, talk about winners and losers in these debates, but, but think about it in, in, in more nuanced terms. Definitely. It, it does feel like, you know, we live in this very increasingly divisive society, doesn't it? And that there's a um, you know, I talk in my work about sort of green or not green, and actually there's no such thing as just sort of lots of shades of green in between. Um, Bob, how about you in terms of language and food? Yeah, I think we need to change the narrative and we're doing that as part of our new uh, transformations through regenerative food systems programme. Um, you know, for example, net zero is very much about harm reduction. Why don't we actually talk about increasing carbon sequestration, for example? It's a lot better way of, uh, of framing it. And I think also art, is a useful uh, uh, approach as well, using visual, not just language, but actually using uh, visual uh, representation to actually change the narrative also. Definitely. Yeah. Um, right, we've got like two minutes left and there was a question, um, just scrolling back, I think about, um, or oh, somebody asked a really nice question actually about um, sort of the York Talks and York University sort of going into nurseries and schools and that kind of thing. Um, what, what role do you think that plays? And are you guys keen to, to do more of that? I guess maybe like, you know, 20, 20 second answers if we can. Um, Henrique, let's go with you first. Yeah, I think, you know, great idea. Um, I think in the past when we've had these live, we did have, I think, um, schools attending uh, and, and schools regularly attend a lot of our other public talks like uh, the York Festival of Ideas. So yes, mm. uh, I'd be more than happy to go and speak to schools and, um, you know, if we do them online, I think that facilitates a lot more, especially as we record them, they can watch them if and when. So yeah, great idea. Brilliant. Um, Matt, how about you? We already do lots of stuff with schools. School, school kids are fantastic. They're always super enthusiastic, super di you know, their questions are always crazy. And, <laughs> and, but, it, but it's great to talk to school kids. And it, it reminds you of the joy of doing research mm. and just under, you know, the joy from understanding things. And sometimes yeah. that gets destroyed by, you know, the bureaucracy that we work in mm -hmm. and, and the day to day. But you go and talk to school kids, especially if they're smaller, and they're just so enthusiastic about understanding the world that it gives you back a little bit of sort of oomph about going back and understanding my little bit of the research problem. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Bob, have you? Um, yeah, I, I can only wholeheartedly agree with that. And schools and nurseries are a key part of uh, the next five years in our new research programme on food systems. And we already do a lot of work with schools, um, particularly in health sciences, uh, with diet and health and uh, educational materials around the food system. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant question. Brilliant. No pressure, Lindsay, but the, the, yours is going to be the final, <laughs> the final comment of the session. So. Just, just to add, uh, on, on top of what everyone else has said, you know, kids educate their parents as well. So if we can target the kids, the kids are the future. So uh, that's a Oh, I love that. That's a fantastic way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's been comments in the in the Q&A and in the chat as well about how brilliant you've all been. Um, and I would absolutely um, second that. Um, if people want to, there are more sessions throughout the day. So if people want to um, to catch up with them and to see them, um, then you can, I think it's in the, um, in the chat there, you can head and you can find tickets for the other things. And also this is all being recorded. So if you want to um, recap any of the uh, talks or go back and have a look at some of those slides and things in more detail, it's all going to be on the YouTube channel, York Ideas. Um, so it might be able to, <laughs> Joan said, might be able to help support the joy of homeschooling. <laughs> so brilliant. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you everybody for coming um, and for all your brilliant questions. And thank you again to our panelists and to um, York Uni for doing this brilliant event. So thank you guys, take care. You too, thanks for chairing, Jen. No worries.